Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. Near Dayton in Columbia County in Washington, the tracks crossed the main road and walked to the edge of the clear-cut fire break to the timber, where I lost them in the Tucannon wilderness. It was archery elk season opening day. I was archery hunting. I found some very big tracks. I backtracked them to the canyon I had just hunted. These tracks went about five or six hundred yards along a clear cut. I lost them in the timber. These tracks sunk deep into the dirt. They had five toes and a heel about twelve inches in behind the toes. Some guys that I camped with claimed to have been visited the night before by a Bigfoot, but the tracks they showed me were unclear. I was skeptical until I found this other set of tracks. On to the next one. In King County in Washington, if you are heading toward Fall City from Snoqualmie right before the Salish Lodge and Snoqualmie Falls, take a right after the bridge onto Mill Pond Road and go left up the hill. Follow the road for three miles, then you take a right, and the main line gate is straight ahead. Up the main line gate a few miles, the J-line road is on your left. That's the intersection where we saw it. It was walking the main line road the opposite way you are traveling. Me and a friend borrowed another friend's truck, skipped school, and went base fishing. It was about three in the afternoon when we decided to head home. We were driving down a gravel road that connected with the main line logging road. As we approached the main line road, we noticed this creature to the right. It was about 80 yards away, and it started moving away from us very fast. The creature disappeared around a bend in the road about 125 yards away. We sat there for half a minute looking at each other in disbelief. Then we took off down toward where he went around the bend. When we got there, the creature was about 200 yards down the road. It looked back toward us and went into the brush. When we got down there, we shut the truck off and could hear the rustling of brush for about 20 seconds, but we couldn't see it. That was it. I grew up my whole life out in the woods, hunting, fishing, and hiking. I know all the animals in the area well. We know what we saw. It was unbelievable. We were close enough to get a good look at it. I was 18 at the time, and now I'm 36, and I can still see its face, its body, and its walk. The creature was at least 7 to 8 feet tall with long brownish red hair. It was a Sasquatch for sure. We never really talked about it to many people. All I know is that these things are out there. We got such a good look at this thing. I can especially remember its huge hand and fingers and how huge and light colored the bottom of its feet were. It looked right at us twice and I felt like it really wasn't that concerned about it. Just me and my fishing partner it was about 3.20 in the afternoon. The area where we saw it was real thick second-growth forest, so thick most places you can't see 20 feet. The lighting that day wasn't really good, and it was a clear day, which is rare in Washington. I have heard of several sightings in that area. Two years after my encounter, two good friends had a similar encounter in a different area. They were driving down a steep road 
off the backside of Rattlesnake Ridge, just down Highway 18 off I-90. They were heading down the road, almost to a switchback, and they noticed a creature on the road below them. They got a good look, and then it disappeared into the brush. They said they were about 150 yards from it. On to the next one. Near Black Diamond in King County in Washington. I was horseback riding about three miles from our house near the Green River Gorge. There is a mine shaft that is covered with a grate that you can stand on. After checking the grate out for a while, I rode on a ways until I came to a clearing that allowed me to see across the Green River to an area that had been clear-cut about one month earlier. I noticed at once that there was a man watching me from about halfway up the hillside. I thought to myself, geez, that guy is huge. Then it began to walk up the hillside with these huge strides and effortlessly stepping over logs and swinging its arms in a most peculiar motion. Its color was a brownish gray. I thought to myself, it's a Sasquatch. I watched it for about two minutes as it worked its way up the hill and into the tree line. The next day, I went riding there again with my father, and we saw it in the same spot watching us again from across the river. Then it walked its way up the hill and back into the woods. It was afternoon and overcast with no precipitation. It was extremely brushy, around the clear cut, with stick and lots of vine maple. The clear cut was devoid of vegetation. On to the next one. In Blue Mountain, in Walla Walla County, in Washington, my belief is most people do not see Sasquatch because they have no idea what they are looking at. Had I not realized nothing belonged where they were, the first two times I would never have recognized them. Not close enough from a distance, a standing Sasquatch will look like two dead tree trunks that have a separation in them and then come together to form a thick trunk and just a mound at the top. They do not look like animals unless they move. When they move, you can't miss it. They are too tall and walk totally upright, covering rough terrain rapidly. At first, though, possible bear grubbing, but as I looked harder, while fighting my horse decided far too big to be a bear and was about to leave when the bear I thought might be grubbing separated. As they stood tall and on two feet, roughly seven feet each or more, and walked slowly down the ridge on two feet, traveling easily on the rough terrain and going separately into heavy timber, where I could not watch any further. They did not come out where I could see them, below the timber, my next sighting, when our company for the weekend at our cabin had departed, I took Caesar, a new horse of ours, out for a ride alone. We were going along the watershed trail toward Lewis Peak. As we came to the exact place where I was kicked two years ago by a borrowed horse and was about one-fourth of a mile from where I sighted the Bigfoot for the first time, I looked to the descending ridge below me. There, I spotted a large, brownish-colored object that looked promising for a bear. But Caesar fidgeted, wanting to return home. He missed his pasture buddy. I don't believe he scented the Sasquatch. I kept watching and was about to leave as I realized the brawn object of interest was far too big to be a bear. And then I was shocked to see the object suddenly stand up, split into two tall, hair-covered animals walking upright and on two feet. Sasquatch, but there was one on the left walking over the edge, dropping from sight, the second descending slowly into the trees below, then dropping down over the far side out of view. The two Bigfoot didn't come back into view lower on the ridge, although I watched as much as possible while returning to the cabin. The terrain is mountainous on Mill Creek Watershed Trail. 
on to the next one. In Kittitif County in Washington, we went out past Roslyn from Klet Elam towards Damon Lissac and the Wenatchee National Forest. There were many small dirt roads off Salmon Lassac Road leading down to the reservoir on the left. We decided to camp down one of these small roads between the reservoir and the main road. It was not a campground, but had some decent places for tents and had been used by campers before as evidenced by a fire ring. There was another tent camper a few hundred yards away. The weather was poor. It began raining on the trip up and kept raining and drizzling off and on the entire time we were there. After unpacking all of our gear and getting camp set up, we began to notice medium-sized rocks, golf ball to baseball size, flying into our camp. At first, we thought it may have been one of the kids goofing around, but after an hour or so, we had accounted for all the kids and the rocks kept up. We continued to have rocks thrown into our camp until the next morning. In addition, roughly ten times during the night, we heard very loud screams coming from further down our side of the reservoir. We were a little worried because we weren't sure who or what was screaming. If we weren't so far from a town, we would have called the police for fear that someone was being hurt. We took turns keeping watch until morning because of the weird stuff going on. At daybreak, we decided to cut our trip short and head home. The weather, rocks, and scream were just too much for some volunteer counselors to handle. I didn't think of the possibility of Sasquatch until several years later when I heard recordings of Sasquatch screams that closely matched what we heard that night. There were three other adult volunteers and about ten children. They all heard the screams and saw the rocks, but had a hard time coming up with reasonable explanation. The event lasted from late afternoon to daybreak the next day. It was raining and drizzling on and off the entire time. It was a fairly heavily treed area between Salmon Lassac Road and the reservoir. We camped in an area that opened out onto a beach. On to the next one. The Clado. They have a reservation area in and around the town of Laytonville, California, about a hundred or so miles south of the Hoopa First Nation Reservation. I inquired with some of the Clado natives in Laytonville, California about Bigfoot Sasquatch. Their name for Bigfoot, Nanny Trunch, literally translates to smell bad in English. Nanny Trunch is a descriptive name which was given to this creature based on one particular observation, its bad smell. Not unlike our societal name Bigfoot based on the creature's big feet. The bad smell observation is also still commonly described today in many modern day reports. The bad smell in association with the creature's name is not the only observation given. One native Clado man, when asked during another inquiry about Nanny Trunch, threw his arms out as wide as he could to indicate the apparent size of this animal, which, according to his gesture, is very wide. The young lady who had originally informed me of the tribal name of the creature had also informed me that there were places her aunt would take her and other family members to observe these creatures when they were younger. I asked if this actually involved seeing the creatures, and I was informed that most of what could be observed besides the smell association was relative to sounds made by the animal. Miwok. They lived throughout the Stanilas National Forest, as well as Yosemite, and some of the surrounding areas in northern central California. The Miwok exist far north of the Yokut, but on the same side of the Sierra Mountains. The Miwok First Nations, which reside in and around some of Yosemite National Park in the central California Sierras 
and down into part of the northern Central Valley of California have several names for giants fitting the same description as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. From a book written in 1910 by C. Hart Merriam titled The Dawn of the World, Myths and Tales of the Miwok Indians of California are additional details to what is referred to as Chihalamche by the Miwok. It is described in the book as the rock giant of the Calaveras County. According to the story, he lives in caves of which there are two near Mountain Ranch or El Dorado in Calaveras County, one at Murphy's and one on the Stanilaus River. More disturbingly, as is also mentioned from the book, in his caves are the remains of his victims, horns of deer and bones of people and different kinds of animals. The book also describes another rock giant called Oelin. According to the story, Oelin is referred to as a great giant who lived in the north. The book also says he was as big as a pine tree. As the story notes, he was a rock giant. This might be a similar observation to the stone giants mentioned frequently among many eastern tribes. It could mean the giant lives among the rocky hillsides which are covered with granite outcroppings scattered all throughout the above-mentioned regions of California, but who knows? The Miwok also have legends of a giant that they refer to as Yayali. One story with some rather suggestive details of Yayali is mentioned from a 1917 book written by E. W. Guilford, titled Miwok Myth. In this story, Yaya Lee kills the husbands of other animals. This is after having deceived them with friendship before being guided back to the unsuspecting animal's den. In the book, the chipmunk is the unfortunate victim. While there, Yaya Lee cooks the husband and tries to feed it to the other members of the dead animal's household, most notably the wife. Yaya Lee then takes up residence in the same den as these still surviving other animals. The giant is described as carrying with it a large basket, which it then uses to carry back humans, which it also prefers as food, most notably fat humans. Yaya Lee is described as killing his victims by using rocks, which it throws at them. An often noted trait of Bigfoot Sasquatch that isn't a sighting is object throwing, which is still often reported today. He is said to kill people of all shapes and sizes, including men, women, children, and old people. In the book, it is over-exaggerated upon that Yaya Lee is so bloodthirsty that when he sees a potential victim, he yells out, There is another victim. There is another victim. Yaya Lee, who takes up residence in dead animals' home, is said to keep the den closed with a giant rock or boulder, which he also places over the opening. There are references to the top of the giant head occasionally sticking up out of what is referred to as the smoke hole. Whenever it danced about in its new den, a pointed head is still a common observation by modern-day eyewitnesses who actually see Bigfoot. As the story goes, other animals in the area that are partial to the victim have dreams of Yayali, who had killed their animal friends. The animals that still inhabit the same den as Yayali grow even more disgusted and, along with other animals, devise setting up traps to kill the giant. One trap involves a stick from a manzanita tree hard like a rock. It is quite possibly the strongest wood there is, that is sharpened like a spear. Another weapon that is used is crushed obsidian rock, like crushed glass, which is thrown into the eyes of Yayali as the dead animal's wife hastily makes an escape. This shows a vast knowledge and some of the apparent uses of these two elements, manzanita wood and crushed obsidian rock. It's almost as if they were actual defenses that may have been implemented 
by the Miwok from the use of strategy at some point. In some parts of the story, these traps set for the giant seem to work, yet it is the dead giant's brother who are said to retaliate. Modern-day observations also suggest that these creatures may hunt in groups and bury their own dead. The woman finally makes it to the safety of her father's house as Yaya Lee's brothers continue chasing her. Upon seeing the giant, her father first shouts for the wind to blow them away, which the giant had then managed to stop. Then he brings the snow, which they had then melted. He then shouts for the hail, which they had then shouted to a stop. The giants seem to have control over the weather. At this point in the story, and it could have been from an actual observation from among the Miwok tribe, the father then calls for a flood, and in doing so, was finally able to drown the giant. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!